Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to four player game, The Key Theft in Cliff Rock Villa, designed by Thomas Singh and published by Haba, who helped sponsor this video. There are actually several games in the Key series, each featuring different crimes that need to be solved, and the rules that I'll teach you here will help you get started in any of them. In this version, we're dealing with a theft at an art exhibition. Actually, three thefts, all on the same day. Three different criminals arrived at different times, stealing three different valuable items and escaping off the nearly impossibly high cliff nearby using different modes of transportation. Thankfully, a storm cut their escape short and all the criminals have been detained, but now the authorities need someone to sort through the evidence and prove which of them are guilty of which robberies. And you're just the person for the job. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, put any one of these colored keys into the middle of the play area, returning the rest to the box. Then take all of the game's included cards and ensure the sides showing colored blocks are all face up. Give these a good mix and then scatter them in a ring around the key in the center of the table. It'll look something like this when you're done. This is the solution board and we won't need it until later, so you can just put it away for now, but ensure you don't look at its other side. Each player now takes one of the included markers, an investigation file, and one of these briefcase screens, which they assemble like this, and then place on the table so that the screen is facing them. And that's the setup. In the key games, you and the other players will be using the evidence scattered across the table to see who can solve the crimes first using the least amount of information. So you will want to work quickly, but it won't always be the person who solves the crime the fastest who will win, as we'll see later. Now there are no turns in the game. Instead, once everyone is ready to begin, someone will call out, start the investigation, and then players begin playing all at the same time by reaching into the center of the table and taking any card they want. The only restriction is that the card must show a colored square that matches the color of the key you've chosen for your game. So in our case, any card we take must have a blue square. The other colors on it don't matter. If you take a card that doesn't show blue, like this one, it will mislead your investigation and you don't want to do that. There are two main types of cards. Witness statements, which will have this symbol in the upper left hand corner, and everything else which make up the lab cards. And there are three types of lab cards. Found objects, fingerprints, and security footage. We'll go over the other symbols on this side in a moment, but just note that after you collect a card, you flip it over and examine it. And here you'll find a clue about the crime. You can examine the clues you've collected at any time, but keep them a secret from the other players, hiding them behind your screen when you're done. And after collecting a card and evaluating the information on it, you may then immediately draw a new card and do the same thing again. Each of these will have unique clues, providing you with more information about the case, and we'll see how to evaluate their information in a moment. You'll want to pay attention to the values in these corners of the cards you collect, because at the end of the game, the winner will be the investigator who not only solved the crime, but did so collecting the lowest total value in cards based on these numbers. The higher the number on a clue, the more specific the clue that it will provide, so it might speed up your investigation, but it will count more against your final score. But we'll see how all of that works later. Now at this point, we have a rough idea of what's going on in the game. You'll be drawing cards, gaining clues from them, and trying to use those clues to determine which criminals stole which items at which times and how they tried to escape. But before we can understand how to use those clues, we first need to examine our briefcase screen and see how it will help us. First, we see big pictures of our three criminals, Greta, Rob, and Nick. Below their pictures is a grid to help us solve the crime. And remember, there are three different crimes, numbered here as one, two, and three. And each crime occurred at a unique time. Crime one was at one o'clock, crime two was at two o'clock, and crime three was at four. Then, for each of these crimes, we have three different aspects we need to solve. The first row represents who committed the crime, so we see our three criminals pictured here again. The next row represents each of the items that were stolen. A wooden mask, diamond-covered elephant statue, or royal crown. Finally, we have the row showing the methods of escape used. One person was in a blue pilot suit flying a red engine-propelled plane. 
Another was in a blue diving suit, escaping by ocean. And another wore yellow and flew a red motorless hang glider. For each crime, you'll see each of those options listed. So now, let's assume we collected this clue from the table and see how to use it with our briefcase screen. First, we should double check that the card we collected shows the required colored square matching the key that we're using in this game. And it does. The symbols in this area also give us a hint as to how this card will help us. In this case, we see a three and the escape symbol. That means the clue on the other side of this card will tell us something about the escape method used in the third crime. In this way, when you're going to take a clue from the pile, you can be on the lookout for the ones you might value over others. For example, if it was later in the game and you already felt like you knew the method of escape for the third crime, you'd want to avoid taking a card like this. But since we don't know the method of escape for that crime, let's take a look and see what it says. Well, this tells us that the person who used the hang glider to escape did not use it at four o'clock. We would record this information by using our marker to cross out that method's icon under the third crime. Sometimes a clue might give you valuable information, but not enough to mark anything off just yet. However, as you get more clues, your previous ones might come to make more sense. Either way, once you've recorded what you can or want to from the clue you've gathered, you immediately grab a new clue. Remember, players won't be taking turns, so just take another one as soon as you like. However, you can only take one clue at a time, but you can take and examine each one as quickly as you want. So let's take a look at another clue and see what else we can learn. Flipping this one over, it tells us that a person wearing blue clothes fled the crime at two o'clock. And just so it's clear, the clothing this clue is referring to is what they were wearing during their escape, not the clothing you see them wearing in these pictures. So looking at the clothing worn by the escaping criminals, we can see that both of these methods have people escaping in blue clothes, so we can cross out the hang glider who is in yellow. And this is actually a big help. Before we learned that the hang glider wasn't used at four o'clock, and now we just learned it wasn't used at two o'clock, so that means it had to have been used at one o'clock. And anytime you know something for sure, you can circle it, which also means I can cross these out here. So hopefully you're starting to get a sense of how the various clues will help you solve the different cases. And as you draw more, you'll get more and more information, but not all of it will be useful. For example, if we gained this clue now, it tells us that a person in a blue diving suit did not escape at one o'clock. But we already knew that, so this was kind of a wasted clue. However, you can never return a clue back to the pile after you've examined it, even if it didn't end up helping you. But remember, the back of the clue will give you a hint about the kind of information it will have, so you can look at that before you take and examine it. Okay. So far, we've been examining what are known as eyewitness clues, which show this symbol in their corner. But there are also three different types of lab evidence clues. Fingerprint, surveillance, and found objects. You get information from these using your investigation file. So let's see how that works, starting with a security camera clue. This will show you a blurry image with one small clear part of the image exposed. And this clear part is what you'll want to pay attention to. Open your investigation file to this first page and look for that revealed element in one of these images. I'm pretty sure this is the slight part in Greta's hair here. So that means we now know that Greta was the thief who stole an item at four o'clock. This page also tells you the full names, age, and gender of the thieves, which might help you with other clues you come across, so keep this page in mind for that as well. Next, let's look at a fingerprint clue. Here, we see a fingerprint that was taken from one of the recovered stolen objects. You now look at this page for the exact match. Here I can see a small circle in the center of the fingerprint, and there's one here as well, but this one also has a dot below it. So now I'm thinking maybe it's this fingerprint here. The person the fingerprint belongs to is shown to its left on the other page. So now we know that Nick stole the wooden mask. Finally, we have object clues, and these will show an object that was discovered in one of the getaway vehicles. Looking at the back of your investigation file, you'll see a security camera scan of all the objects the thieves brought into the art exhibit. And I think you'll agree, it's surprising they were allowed into the art exhibit at all. I mean, look at what they were carrying. You now look for who had the object that was recovered. In this case, the pen. 
Now you have to be careful because there are pens in each bag, so we'll want to find the exact match, which I believe is here. So this tells us that Greta used the plane as her method of escape because her pen was found in it. And now you know how to interpret the different types of clues. But just keep in mind there are still several different ways for clues to be presented, and part of the fun will be figuring out how to use their information to make your deductions. Eventually, someone at the table is going to feel like they've solved the crime, and once they're ready, if they're the first person to do this, they'll grab the key in the middle of the table. Now this doesn't mean they've won, but it indicates they were done first, which can help them later, as we'll see. The investigation for everyone else doesn't end, though. The other investigators may continue drawing cards and trying to solve the case for themselves. But the player who took the key doesn't draw any more cards. And once everyone is finished, it's now time to see who solved the case correctly. To do this, each person will generate their own number code representing their answer using this chart found on their screen. For each element of the crime, the person, stolen item, and escape method, you'll generate a single number based on the order they're found on your board going from left to right. For example, let's say this is my briefcase board at the end of the game. And just to be clear, I've crossed out and circled most of these randomly so as not to give anything away. But looking at the criminal's row, I have Greta first, then Nick, then Rob. I then check this area for that exact pattern, which is found on this row that shows Greta, Nick, and Rob in that order. And this is known as combination five. I then write that number in this connected box and follow the same steps for the stolen items and getaway method, so that in the end, I have a three-digit number. Once everyone has their three-digit number, the player who grabbed the key tests their number first by taking this solution board and looking for the three-number combination that they came up with. If their code can't be found on the solution board, then they got the wrong answer and would pass the board to the next player on their left who got a different result so they can test their code. On the other hand, if their code is there, they insert their key into the related lock beside it and then flip the board over. If the color of the key matches the lock on the back, they've solved the case correctly. If there isn't a match, then they made a mistake in their deductions and will now pass the board to the next player on their left with a different result to see if they found the right match. If no one got a match, then the players all lose and the criminals got away. That said, any investigators who did get a match deserve congratulations for helping to solve the crimes. But now we need to see who was the top investigator. To do this, each player who got the right result totals the value of all the cards they took from the table. And if the player who grabbed the key got the right result, they first get to discard any one card from among the lowest valued cards that they have. Now, the player who has the lowest total score wins. In the case of a tie, the tied player who collected the fewest of these lab cards wins, and these are easy to identify because they always have a value of four. If there's still a tie, then the tied players share the victory. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, how can I replay the game once I've solved the crime? Wouldn't the three-digit code always be the same? Well, that's what the different keys are for. Each time you play, pick a different key, and that will create a different final outcome. Now, just to be clear, the outcome for the blue key will always be the same. Likewise, the outcome for the red key will always be the same. But these will be different from each other, and there are nine different keys. So you'll have nine different outcomes. And then, by the time you've played each one, your memory of the earliest keys and their outcomes should be pretty jumbled, and you can play those ones again. The game also comes with rules for solo play, which are almost identical to the multiplayer rules, except that once you've solved the case, you don't get to discard one of your cards for being the first one done. That said, once you have solved the case, you can use this chart here to determine how well you did. When playing a game with more than one person, you can also use the chart to get an official evaluation of everyone's performance. But otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play The Key Theft in Cliff Rock Villa. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.